Welcome to the most exciting, the most provocative, the most brutal martial arts competition that there is. In the 90s, a controversial new sport hits television. America can't look away. This is the real deal here. Everything goes, no gloves, no rules. Oh, that is brutal. I never saw anything like this. Suplex. Wrestling, kickboxing, boxing, submission holds, all these things wrapped into one fight. The fight could end by you throw in the towel, you get knocked out, or you die. He's out. My goodness. But the violence inherent in no-holds-barred combat Someone's going to get seriously hurt. We'll leave the UFC in a fight for its own survival. Banned in North Carolina. Banned in Mississippi. Is Jack Kevorki in the referee? It's just a disgusting way to make money. We don't let roosters engage in cockfighting. We don't allow human beings to engage in this kind of activity. The judge said, your show's going to get shut down. This first match in UFC history sounds like the setup to a bad joke. A sumo wrestler and a French kickboxing champion walk into an eight-sided cage. And they go. But there's no punchline here. Just this. When he kicked him in the face and teeth went flying, everything just stopped. Like, did he just do that? We never seen something like that other than on the street. Kathy, did you catch that too? I, no, I think it's under the table here. Oh, okay. That was a pretty heavy way to start the Ultimate Fighting Championship. It also gave people who tuned in exactly what they were looking for. Good luck, Paul. A first glimpse at a sport popular overseas, mixed martial arts or MMA. Mixed martial arts is a tournament format whereby you can kick, punch, and you can grapple. It incorporates karate, taekwondo, judo, wrestling, jujitsu. This is the real deal here. Everything goes, no gloves, no rules. This is exciting. It shows who the real men are. If you're a real fight fan, you might see the guy doing a reverse arm bar, and that impresses you. If you're just a casual observer, it's the mayhem. It's the, the blood. It's the guts. That's what it's all about. This part is the blood and they loved it. Finish him! <laughs> with its intoxicating mix of fighting styles and a roster packed with steely-eyed competitors, the early UFC is a far cry from the predetermined matches and scripted characters seen in professional wrestling. Whoa, and it bears no resemblance to the glitz and glamour of professional boxing. This is not even the UFC you know today. This is an anything-goes, unregulated, unsanctioned free-for-all. Oh, oh, that is brutal. That attracts fighters from around the world to a series of cage matches where anything can happen. Push them out of the ring. UFC in the 90s sold the gore, the violence. And that's part of it. But that's not the whole truth. The real story of how the UFC grew to become a multi-billion dollar sports franchise begins with a 46-year-old salesman in California who makes a living hustling everything from office machines to health club memberships. I was a classic entrepreneur. I owned a car dealership in San Diego where I did my own stunts. Hurdling 25 feet through the air is a very big risk. You would not do it. Why take the same risk when you buy a new car? I jumped off a 10-story building. I got shot with a 357 Magnum. I got set on fire. And then I got dangled from a helicopter. Anything to sell a car. But I also got burned out selling things that other people created. And I was ready to create something myself. I'm Art Davey, the creator of the UFC. Having trained as a boxer in his youth, Davey is fascinated by the huge array of fighting styles from around the world. During the 1980s in the martial arts magazines, there were articles about who would win 
in a contest between different martial arts styles. The boxer versus the sumo wrestler. What about kung fu versus karate? My tiger kung fu is better than yours. I started to think about what I could do in the way of a tournament. And one of the things I discovered was an article in a national magazine about an individual named Horion Gracie. The Gracie family was a family of martial artists from Brazil who innovated a particularly modern style of martial arts. They called it Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Stand by. I'm Robin Black. I analyze and commentate fighting all over the world. The statement the Gracie family was trying to make was that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu could defeat anyone regardless of size. Horian learned jujitsu from his father, and when Horian Gracie emigrated to America, he told the martial arts magazines that he was ready to issue the Gracie Challenge. Didn't matter where you came from or who you were, you like boxing, you studied karate all your life, come into our gym and test it. And we believe we will defeat you using Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And they did. They were able to defeat almost every style. The Gracie Challenge is the clash of competing fighting styles that Davey has been dreaming about. Who better to partner with than this famous family of fighters? I wound up working right down the street from the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Torrance. So I went down and I presented to him the idea that maybe we could do this as a big tournament. To promote the supremacy of his family's fighting style, Gracie agrees to partner up on an MMA tournament if Davey can overcome the state laws and athletic commission rules that would prohibit this kind of fighting event. He said, how do we do that? I said, I've got a plan. I said, I have figured out that the state of Colorado has a loophole in the law that will allow us to do a bare knuckle tournament. And I went up to Colorado. I got us a limited liability company for Horian and I. We called it WOW Promotions, War of the World. So I said to Horian, we got to raise some money. And find someone to air the event on TV. I got turned down by HBO, I got turned down by Showtime, and I got turned down by ESPN. They all said the same thing to me. Are you crazy? Television of the future? I've got it now. But in 1993, the television landscape in America is going through a transformation. Newly launched communication satellites make up to 150 channels available to homes across the country. WrestleMania is coming at your live! It also opens the way for pay-per-view events, where audiences pony up a one-time fee to see live events at home on TV. Davey is hoping his War of the Worlds will be one of them. There was a company in New York called Semaphore Entertainment Group. Now, they had been doing concerts and comedy on pay-per-view. You know, like The Judd's Farewell Tour, Andrew Dice Clay. Maybe I'll piss on you tonight, hey? But they didn't have a franchise. I said, young men all over North America, eventually the world will pay to see this. Semaphore's executive, Bob Myrowitz, is intrigued by the idea and agrees to a 50-50 partnership with War of the Worlds Productions joining Davey as one of the UFC's co-creators. They were looking for something that could be repetitive. What could they do and then do it again and then do it again? And that became why Semaphore Entertainment Group really decided, okay, we're gonna go in on this. I'm Big John McCarthy. I'm known as one of the original referees and officials for the UFC, still ugly as ever. Now, a guy named Michael Abramson from Semaphore, yeah, close to last minute, was the one that said, hey, you know, War of the Worlds tells me that this is a movie. <laughs> this isn't a movie, this is real life. This is the ultimate fighting championship. And everyone went, hey, that's a pretty good name. The title sticks. With funding secured, Davey and his creative team are eager to heighten the drama of the competition by creating a fighting platform perfectly suited to the UFC's unique style of combat. I thought about some sort of a cage, but maybe with a moat. We could put sharks in it. 
Then I had thought about some sort of a, 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 a circle, and then maybe the outer ring would be electrified. Eventually it came up, what about chain link? We could use chain link that would keep them from falling outside of the fighting surface. And they put all these straight panels together, it becomes an octagon. But Davy still needs fighters courageous enough or crazy enough to enter this octagon and defeat three different opponents to be declared champion. My plan was an eight-man tournament. And I said to Horion, can one of your brothers compete against three different fighters in one night? Horian immediately offers up his younger brother, Hoist Gracie, a skilled master of the family's Brazilian fighting style, jiu-jitsu. Hoist was chosen by the family, not because he was the biggest and the strongest, but because he was the smallest. If Hoist could defeat bigger, stronger men, it proved the effectiveness of Gracie jiu-jitsu. Soon other contenders like sumo wrestler Taylor Tuli and boxer Art Jimerson are added to the card. But Davey's still looking for the face of this new sport. What he finds is a powerful and explosive fighter whose rivalry with Hoist Gracie will come to define the UFC and be its first major draw. This changes everything here. This will outsell the Frazier fight, outsell the Fulman fight, all the fights in the history. This will be a bigger crowd. In June of 1976, America's most famous athlete, boxer Muhammad Ali, agrees to fight Japanese wrestler Antonio Inoki in a highly publicized event. I didn't come to Japan to leave my title to you. I come to destroy you. It's an unusual matchup that brings together two fighters from wildly different disciplines and one that anticipates the birth of mixed martial arts. Despite a handful of explosive moments, Enoki spends most of the 15 rounds on his back, with Ali standing over him, barely able to throw a punch. The fight was ultimately declared a draw and dismissed as a bizarre one-off. But in the 90s, 46-year-old Art Davey is poised to bring mixed martial arts back to the mainstream with his ultimate fighting championship. Most of the fighters for the eight-man tournament had been chosen, but Davey isn't satisfied. I was very clear that I was in show business. In addition to looking for the world's best fighter, I also had to find the world's most entertaining fighter. 5,000 miles away in Tokyo, Japan, a young grappler from the U.S. is already making a name for himself as a mixed martial arts champion. My DNA is a fighter. I lived and breathed being a fighter. I'm Ken Shamrock, former UFC heavyweight champion and Pancrase champion. I want to go back a little bit because I think that there's a story here. Born Ken Kilpatrick in 1964 in Macon, Georgia, the future fighter, his two brothers, and their single mom live in extreme poverty. We slept in one room, no bed. Sometimes we didn't even have food. And I remember stealing food out of the trash can. It was, it was bad. I don't remember ever being hugged by my mother. I didn't know my father. That's my childhood. After his family moves to Napa, California, 10-year-old Ken runs away from home. I was hanging out with bad people, surviving only in ways that you know how, that's stealing and robbing. It was lay down and die or stand up and fight. One fateful day, Ken has to fight for his life. Some other kids came walking up that weren't from our neighborhood and words were said, and the next thing you know, fists were throwing, and I had a knife on me. And I ended up trying to stab a guy and ended up getting stabbed myself. I lost consciousness because I was spurting blood out and, uh, and woke up in the hospital, handcuffed to a bed. The police were looking for me for a while. My rap sheet was like that thick. Ken becomes a ward of the court. Then, at the age of 14, he meets the man who will give him his last name and a glimpse at a better life. Bob Shamrock dedicated his life to
to helping at-risk kids. When I walked into the Bob Shamrock Boys' Home, this was a mansion. It was 18 boys in there. And then Bob Shamrock comes up and he goes, come on over here. And then he walked us over to this, this bar that had like soda and candy and ice cream. And I was like, this is not real. Pinch, pinch, pinch. And he goes, I'm telling you right now in this house, you have a fresh start. He said, Ken, you are violent and you fight all the time. He goes, let's figure out how we can vent that frustration into something positive. Bob Shamrock enrolls Ken in the local high school. It's on the football and wrestling teams that Ken discovers a place where violence is rewarded. I look around and my teammates are jumping, yeah, nice job. And the coaches like were like, no, do that again. And I'm like, this can't be right. I hurt this kid, I hit him, and they're telling me it's okay. And Bob said, you gotta know the rules. And if you play within those rules, whether it's sports or life, you can be successful in anything you wanna be. A father-son bond forms between Bob and Ken. I love my biological mom, but she didn't have the means to take care of us. We got into trouble. I couldn't go back there. I felt like my life with Bob, that's where I was supposed to be. And in 1982, Shamrock formally adopts the teenager. That's who took care of me. I was a part of this family. In his final year of high school, Shamrock is definitely getting noticed on the football field, but he's becoming disenchanted with the sport. I just didn't want to do that, so I ended up going into pro wrestling. Vince Torelli. Working under stage names like Vince Torelli and Mr. Wrestling, Shamrock becomes an expert in pro wrestling style of choreographed combat. But he eventually tires of pulling his punches. Everything was working in pro wrestling for me, but I was always that guy trying to find the most extreme level that I could actually get to. And I ran into a friend of mine, Dean Malenko, and he showed me this tape. And then I saw these two Japanese guys on there in the early 90s, Japan's Universal Wrestling Federation is pioneering a new, more aggressive style of pro wrestling, where fighters often incorporate elements of martial arts in the ring. I never saw anything like this. Judo, kickboxing, boxing, submission holds, all these things wrap into one fight. Now, if you can do that, you are truly a badass. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I want to do that. And he goes, all right, man, I'll hook you up. Hey. Shamrock's invited to join the organization's roster of fighters. It's the beginning of his career as a so-called shoot fighter, where the fighting inside the ring is unscripted and unplanned up to a certain point. I literally made sure that everything I did landed. I hit them, I kicked them, I threw them, I put submissions hold on them. But there was always a predetermined ending. In other words, we always knew who was going to win. I was tired of that, and I wanted something more. I wanted the real deal. In 1993, Shamrock joins Japan's Pancraze Hybrid Wrestling, which promises real hand-to-hand -hand combat. And this time, there is no script. We were gonna take pro wrestling and we were going to make it real. We were so far in advance of anyone, even if they were world champion kickboxers, we would take them down, we would destroy them. Not having to lose to somebody, there was nothing better than that. That was the elite of elites. That same year, Shamrock becomes the first King of Pancras open weight champion. I felt that I was good enough to beat anybody. This is my world, this is it. And then all of a sudden I hear about this thing called the UFC. Ken Shamrock was exactly what I was looking for. He's Captain America. He's six foot one, he's 212 pounds. He's got a bodybuilder's body and he competes in red speedos. And I knew he was gonna be a star. Yeah! And I said, tell me about what you're doing in Japan. 
I said, I fight in a mixed martial arts company where it's kicks, punches, throws, submissions. He said, well, it's the real deal. I said, no, what I want to do is the real deal, a shoot. And he says, anything goes. No rules. I was like, all right, okay. He said, well, I'm interested. Well, I wound up signing him. But in my mind, I'm like, dude, there's no way they can let this happen. They're sanctioning bodies everywhere. There's no way that they're gonna allow somebody to kick somebody in the head. But I'm literally the mixed martial arts champion. I have to go defend my title. Days before the event, the eight elite fighters chosen for the UFC's inaugural tournament begin arriving in Denver. We fly in. The whole time, I'm like, it's not gonna happen. We get in there, there's a press conference, and I notice one guy, Gerard Godot, who I saw fight in Japan. And I see Hoist, and he's walking around in his gi. And I'm like, who walks around in their gi? Dude, I mean, come on, like, that's weak. I'm thinking to myself, there's no way. I'm going to destroy these kids, man. I'm going to kill them. But after the press conference, the fighters are surprised to be called into a meeting to discuss the rules of the tournament. I'm like, what do you mean rules me? I thought there was no rules. There was only three rules for the fight. No groin shots, no biting, and no eye gouging. The fight could end by you throw in the towel, you get knocked out, or you die. And we now want you to sign on the rules. Horion was there to talk to the fighters. Well, he winds up talking about the fact that the kicker punchers can't wrap their fist. He said you wouldn't do that in the street if you were in a fight. You wouldn't have time. Well, that doesn't appeal to Zane Fraser, who's a kickboxer, and Art Jimison, who's a professional boxer. Both of them are now arguing, we need to be able to wrap our hands. Shamrock is also given a handicap by the organizers. They took away my wrestling shoes. If you understand that everything starts from your foundation, which is your feet, your movement for takedowns, and then all of a sudden you get these shoes taken off of you, it's like being on ice because you've never been there before. Well, now the room is turning into chaos. I figured the next thing that's gonna happen is a brawl. I'm gonna have fighters in jail, fighters in the hospital, and there's no event tomorrow night. The night before the Ultimate Fighting Championship's first match, fighters are in fierce disagreement over the last minute addition of new rules and regulations. UFC creator Art Davey is worried that the tournament is in jeopardy. Who saves my butt is the sumo wrestler, Taylor Tooley. He picks up the one-page release. He says, I've already signed it. He slams it down on the table, and he says, I'll see everybody else tomorrow night. When he stood up and said that, it really took away any opportunity for anybody to say, wait a minute, this is supposed to be no rules. Anything goes. Why are you taking things away? Ken Shamrock comes up to me, and he says, is this a shoot or a work? A work is a scripted bout. A shoot is a real fight. Leading right up to it, it was almost like a question of, is this real or is it not real? I said, Ken, we've been all through this before. You know that. It has all the hype and trappings of a Vegas boxing match. Smoke, lights, cameras, and women. The following night, with pay-per-view cameras rolling, local fight fans trickle into Denver, Colorado's McNicholas Sports Arena to witness the Ultimate Fighting Championship's first ever mixed martial arts tournament. There are no rules, no judges scores, and no time limits. And no how-to manual for the video crew hired to capture the action for the pay-per-view audience watching at home. There was chain link fence, and I mean, your normal cameraman on the ground is just gonna be shooting through a fence all night. That looks horrible. I gotta get them higher over this barrier. And that's when I said, okay, there's one thing missing, and that's looking down, because guys are gonna be down there. It was kind of a cool angle. Nobody had ever used that before. Are we good? Yeah, he said good. My name's Mark Lucas, and I was the first live TV director of the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Hell of a ride. <laughs> I'm a little worried. I see this almost empty McNichols Arena, which is like 18,000 seats. I think maybe there was 3,000. 
And so I had to get all the camera and don't give me wide shots where you see empty seats. The arena was so empty, I figured maybe there's only five people watching on a pay-per-view. Please welcome the contestants for the first match of tonight's ultimate fighting championship. It's a shocking sight. 200-pound French savat champion Gerard Gordeaux facing off against Taylor Tuli, a sumo wrestler twice Gordeaux's size. 420 pounds, make room for the giant. What follows is a bloody spectacle. Tuli lowers his head, extends his arms, and charges him like he's a bull. Gerard Gordeaux throws a right kick and it hits Taylor flush in the middle of the face. What do you think? Let's go. Whoa. We're just missing teeth there. And you see one of his teeth come flying out. And then he finishes up with a right hand, which catches him in the eye and busts the eye open. And all of a sudden, blood. Just tons of blood. Horrifying. I said, okay, this is real. This is really real. The match has been called. Gerard Jojo is the winner. I'm back at that point in the dressing area. Who's back there watching the monitor is Ken Shamrock. That kick, you, there's no way you couldn't believe that. He turns around and he looks at me and he nods. That's when he knew it was a shoot and not a work. The second match, pitting kickboxer Kevin Rozier against karate champ Zane Frazier, is also horrifically violent. But it's the final matches of the quarterfinals that introduce audiences to the UFC's future superstars. Out of the red corner, Hoist Gracie! Hoist Gracie was not a very imposing guy. I thought, I, I, how long is this guy going to last? Here it is. There's Aaron. Yeah. Well, he was like a boa constrictor. Fight, 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 fight. And then there was Ken Shamrock. He was put together like a brick shit house. No fat on him. I have to admit, he looks pretty fantastic. He looked the part, and he could fight. On this side, there's the tap out right there. Just too painful. I'm like, I'm way up here. <laughs> I didn't think anybody could beat me. Ladies and gentlemen, our second semifinal match of the evening. Now, in the semifinals, you've got Hoist Gracie facing Ken Shamrock. I think this will be a very exciting bout. Here they go. Look at that. Is, is it going to be perfect? Right the they go right away. Shamrock, in his red Speedo, immediately appears to have the upper hand. But Gracie, wearing the white gi Shamrock found laughable, proves he's no joke. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is about weaponizing the human body. Or, in this case, as Hoist did, you can use the fabric of your clothing. Here's where the gi comes in, Bill. Look at that left hand of Hoist. It's grabbing the right gi lapel. As he's choking me with his gi, I'm going, like, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> What's going on? I can't wear my wrestling shoes, but he's choking me with his gi. The more that he struggles, the more it starts to just tighten up. And so Ken was in trouble. There's the tap. And I tap. And I remember sitting there going, I just lost. I lost to this guy in pajamas. <laughs> it's the opening bell of what will be a bitter rivalry between the two fighters. Gracie goes on to defeat Gerard Gordeaux in the final. These Gracies are anacondas. It's over. To become the UFC's first champion, proving the dominance of his family's famous fighting style. But as the sparse crowd departs, Art Davey and his partner, Bob Myrowitz, worry their creation hasn't connected with audiences. Then they hear the pay-per-view numbers. $14.95 was the price. We wound up doing more than 87,000 subscribers on pay-per-view. It was stunning. It was huge. Bob Myrowitz was a very happy guy. His gamble paid off. It was a big success, and right away they knew, oh, we're going to do another one. Four months later, the UFC returns to Colorado, this time with twice as many fighters. People come to see skill. They come to see courage. The fresh roster of contenders aren't the only new faces appearing in the dreaded octagon. Torian Gracie suggested to me, what about big John McCarthy as the referee? 
John McCarthy is a L.A. police officer who trains with the Gracies, but he's hesitant to accept the new job offer. I did not want to be a referee. I wanted to fight. I thought I could do okay with that. But I loved the Gracies. I loved the sport. I loved what they were trying to do. As I was asked to go, to go up and see Art Davey, he goes, I need you to start these fights. I want a statement and I want a hand signal. I said, I got two guys standing inside a cage, one over here, one over there, that want to beat the shit out of each other. I'm going to ask him, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. And he goes, that's it. That's exactly what I want. I said, OK. Let's get it on. I turned to the TD at one point and I say, is he saying, let's get it on? That's great. I love this. And it became his signature thing. Let's get it on. UFC 2 is an even bigger success than its predecessor, more than tripling UFC 1's pay-per-view subscribers. The event also multiplies the unfettered violence. It was the bloodiest. The UFC's growing fan base may be thrilled by the bloodshed, but McCarthy is left shaken by the events. The referee was not supposed to be able to stop the fight. The fighter will tap out or the corner will throw in the towel. I had one instance where Scott Morris was against Pat Smith. Pat Smith starts to open up and hit him with big elbows. It cuts him in a couple of places, and he gets just basically knocked out. And I'm screaming at the corner, throw your towel. You know, and they looked at me, and they shook their head, and they threw the towel into the audience. And you've got a corner that has been told by the fighter, don't ever throw the towel. And now the fighter is so hurt that they can't even tap because they don't have that functionality in their brain that someone's going to get seriously hurt. He's out. He's out. My goodness. That's intense, folks. I can't be the guy that stands there and lets someone get beat to death and I do nothing about it. I said, when a fighter cannot intelligently defend themselves, the referee has to be able to have the power to stop the fight. Organizers agree with McCarthy and institute the new rule. What UFC 2 doesn't deliver is a rematch between its breakout stars. Okay, we're back here with Ken Shamrock. Ken, what do you think about it so far? Ken Shamrock is out due to an injury. And how would you beat Hoist next time? It's a secret. <laughs> and so Hoist Gracie is crowned champion once again. Art Davey writing in the name. But organizers make the promise of a second cage match between the two fighters the centerpiece of UFC 3. I think Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie's rivalry was very real. Everything that they've learned is being brought to this moment to fight each other in a cage. Despite the hype, the rematch doesn't go as planned. Shamrock is in fighting shape, and he's even allowed to wear his wrestling shoes. But then, the unthinkable. The towel is in. Hoist Gracie is out of the competition. What a shocker. Unbelievable. Gracie drops out midway through the tournament. He threw in the towel and said he was exhausted, like his body was exhausted. Hoist was hurt big time for him not to be able to fight. To me, I thought that was chicken. Everybody's exhausted. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm hurt. When he backed out of the fight, I say I'm not going into the finals because I wanted Hoist, and I made no bones about it. I said, I want Hoist. His father is there, Bob Shamrock, and he says to him, you're walking away from $60,000. Kent said, I'm going home. He walked out. But it allowed the feud to continue between Hoist and Shamrock. The following year, it finally happens. It will be their bloodiest battle yet. But waiting in the wings is a man who threatens to put a chokehold on the UFC itself. Sooner or later, someone's going to get very badly injured. At least seven people are dead after a suspected car bomb. A lot of blood gushing from the man's head. Boxes with human body parts. There's a saying in American newsrooms, if it bleeds, it leads. And in the early 90s, bloody confrontations consumed television news. From the mayhem of the Gulf War. The chaos in downtown Oklahoma City. To the breathless coverage of the Oklahoma City bombing. Broadcasters seem intent on satisfying their viewers' fascination with extreme violence. It's against this backdrop that the Ultimate Fighting Championship emerges as must-see TV for bloodthirsty audiences. How are you here, man? See blood. Blood. We got the blood going now. The 
blood is flowing. After four blood-soaked tournaments, organizers are lighting up the octagon for their most anticipated fight ever, a rematch between their two biggest stars, Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie. The match you've all been waiting for. It's called a super fight, a face-off between two fighters that exist outside of the evening's regular tournament. And here we go. But in order to keep the broadcast within the two-hour pay-per-view window, a new rule is once again being added at the last minute. It has a 30-minute time limit. Shamrock and Gracie are two of the UFC's toughest fighters, but both struggle to land a definitive blow that will turn the fight in his favor. These two are so good, we might have another long bout right here. The fight ended up going 31 minutes. Stop, and I stopped the fight, give them a minute's rest, and then put them back for five minute overtime. Let's get it all! Five minute OT underway. Ken landed one punch that, you know, it puffed up Hoy's eyes, cut him and stuff. He nailed Gracie. It looks like Shamrock is finally besting his longtime foe, which will make the grappler the first super fight champion in UFC history. But it isn't meant to be. It was a draw. And the crowd does not like it at all. It was a draw, that's the way it is. The crowd is treating Shamrock as though he's the winner. I just had fought Hoist to its so-called draw after he was beat up to the snot. Why aren't you labeling me the champion? The Gracies, who were instrumental in creating the No Rules UFC, are equally upset after the super fight. Horian said, oh, we can't fight with time limits. We're gonna get out of this now. And he pulls Hoyce out of, of the UFC. As the Gracies exit the fighting league they helped found, in 1997, a Republican senator from Arizona enters the battle to destroy the UFC forever. We would prevent such matches between animals. I'm not sure why you can argue that we would allow such things between human beings. And he'd written a letter to all 50 governors in which he said, please do not let this come to your state. This is human cockfighting. We expect certain standards of behavior in our society, and this is clearly uh, in gross violation of that. I really noticed it when John McCain uh, debated Bob Meyerowitz on CNN. The fact is that nobody has been injured, seriously injured, doing this ultimate fighting championship. 36 states have already outlawed them. It won't be long before all 50 do. Community outrage has led to it being banned in North Carolina, banned in Mississippi. All of these states were starting to come up with ways of trying to stop the events. And so we were ending up in court. The UFC finds itself fighting a battle for survival, and Art Davey can't see a path to victory for the brutal sport he helped create. I saw where we were going. Maybe we would be banned. Maybe McCain would win. So I figured, let me get out now while the getting is good. After the UFC's fifth tournament, Davey decides to sell his share to his co-founder, Semaphore CEO, Bob Myrowitz. But first, Davey needs to convince his partner, Horian Gracie. Horian was very upset. He didn't really want to sell. And I said, we should sell. It's the right thing. So Bob made me a seven-figure offer for WOW Promotions. And it was a good seven-figure offer. And I said, yes. Two weeks later, I get a call from Bob Meyerowitz, and he says, I don't know how to put together the fights. I need to have you still be the, book the booker, the matchmaker. I became the ultimate fighting commissioner. The greatest martial arts competition in the world. The ultimate now just an employee of the organization he helped create, Davey sees his worst fears realized. The judge said, your show's going to get shut down. Is it a thrilling sport or a killing sport? And violence the stuff that really sells a spectacle. It is called ultimate fighting. By the late 90s, the UFC is more often making news for its battles outside of the company's famous octagon. Is Jack Kevorkian the referee? It's just a tacky, <laughs> disgusting kind of way to make money. 
The owner is in a constant state of damage control as he's forced to find ways to appease state regulators. Anyone who thinks they can tell us a way to make this a better, safer sport, we're happy to have it. All that drama, all that controversy got in the way of me focusing on going out there and doing my job. Ken Shamrock is the UFC's highest paid fighter. But as he struggles to maintain his spot at the top of the UFC's roster of fighters, he also finds ways to deal with the stress. I did abuse drugs. I did do that stuff. I wanted to be able to kill the pain. I wanted to have a good time, and I want to think about anything. I got to tell you something about mixed martial arts. It's a very hard sport. If you add that also the pressures of being a celebrity, quite frankly, some of them crack up. We'd all go out and fight, and then we would club it. And you get in those clubs. Alcohol make people brave. With my face, my name, guys would want to fight me. One guy hit me in the back with a bat, and I just react. I turn around and hit him, bam. Hit him in the temple and blinded him. There was another time I put a dude in a coma, shoved his cheekbone up into his brain, put him in a coma. I must have had two, three hundred thousand dollars in lawsuits, uh, paying attorneys to defend me. Um, and I got to a point where I just I decided I was not I wasn't going to clubs anymore. If I was gonna do something, it was gonna be at my house. The UFC has a run-in of its own, this time with lawmakers in New York State who threatened to deliver a death blow to the organization. We were scheduled to do a UFC 12. We had already sold several thousand tickets. The state of New York all of a sudden started saying, you gotta, you gotta follow what we want. And the UFC goes back to court saying, we can't do this. Among the new rules proposed by the state, a requirement that the 32-foot octagon be widened to a minimum of 40 feet in diameter. There's no time to rebuild, and floor seats around the stage are already sold out. With a sold-out show set for tonight in Niagara Falls, promoters filed a $32 million lawsuit against the state, arguing such rules would have a catastrophic effect on business. The judge in the end is saying, look, they're saying these are what our rules are. If you want to follow their rules, you can put on your show. If you don't follow them, your show is going to get shut down. Semaphora Entertainment's last-minute appeal in federal court is thrown out. And after all the work to create the league, the broken bones, the blood on the canvas, it looks like the final bell is being rung for the ultimate fighting championship. We had to leave in the middle of the night because the court had shut us down. There's gotta be a law against that. All of a sudden they come in after you've already spent all of that money and then tell you, nope, you can't be here. Can you imagine all the people, all the cameras, the cage, the people who sell the t-shirts, everything canceled the show's over when you're part of a team that feels like a family where all of us together are creating this thing that's a very special period it emboldens and strengthens you as a human as a team as individuals and it strengthened the ufc these fighters this is what they needed. This is who they were, their purpose. They needed the producers. They needed the cameras, the referee. Everybody needed each other. And so we're gonna go put a show on somewhere else. The show must go on. <laughs>